the energy, man. This is great. God bless you. Thanks for uh, honoring me by uh, asking me to be here. It means a lot to me, especially coming from uh, someone like Pastor Gary, who is, if you weren't in the room, I would say a hero. But uh, he, since he's in the room, we'll just say a really nice guy. <laughs> there are very few churches like this. That's not good. But praise God for this church and for the churches like this that are standing firm in a time of unfurling madness. Crazy. In case you wonder if the world is going crazy, I'm here to tell you, obviously it is. Like, is there any question? If you know that it's going crazy, that's a sign that you're sane. If you don't know it's going crazy, your problem is that you're part of the crazy. So I'm here to encourage you that everything that was always true is still true and will always be true. For example, uh, roosters really can't lay eggs. Did you know that? <laughs> yeah. Now, I know it's harsh to say that, but uh, I'm just crazy enough not to care. Roosters, um, I'm, I'm sure some of them think they're chickens, but I don't really know that we need to, you know, redo the universe for those roosters. I just don't think that it's necessary, but that's just because I'm crazy. And if you're crazy like me, yeah. And I'm sure some hens think they're roosters, uh, and yet uh, they lay eggs. It's very confusing, isn't it? So let's just, let's go back to the basics. What the Bible says is true, what we've always known to be true, what every culture has known to be true is still true. Um, if somebody was not elected, they're not technically, uh, you know, allowed uh, to be taken seriously. Now, and by the way, you know, if I'm wrong, you could just prove it to me by, you know, opening up the books and showing me and whatever. And when you resist that, makes me really suspicious. You know what I'm saying? You know what I'm saying? It's like, no, nope, you can't look in there. Don't look in there. Okay, I wasn't gonna look in there, but now I'm definitely gonna try to look in there. <laughs> so we all know this. Not everybody, uh, you know, has a big voice. And so you think you're alone. You're not alone. Most people in America understand that what is happening is an unprecedented madness. And God calls us to stand. He calls us, like your pastor, to uh, use our influence in our spheres to stand for the truth. Uh, you don't have to be looking for fights. But if you stand for the truth, you know, people are going to, they're going to get uh, a little crazy because they don't like that. Well, that's on them. You, if you're called by God uh, to serve him, you really have no choice. So if somebody says, just a little pinch of incense to Caesar, you don't mind, right? Just a little pinch, worship Caesar a little bit. And it's, you know, it's no big deal. It means nothing. Just do it. And then he can go and, and be a Christian. And you're going to say, well, I can't do that. They're going to go, are you insane? Just do it. You want to eat at that restaurant? A little pinch of Caesar. Come on. You want to go to the gym? Whatever you want, just a little pinch. And as Christians, with joy, we can say, no, I'm free. I'm free in Christ. Oh, and by the way, even if I'm not a Christian, I'm an American, and it's a free country. So, no. I, I only say these things to get to get cheap applause. That's really the only reason. I wasn't gonna to touch on any of this stuff. No, in all seriousness, I say these things because we need to be reminded that God is on his throne. And I'm here to say even more than that, to say that his hand is still on this nation. And I believe he's allowing us to go through this season of madness to wake up the church. Because many churches have no idea what we're talking about here. And, and sometimes, Things have to go nuts before people will wake up. And if you didn't know that things are going nuts, just turn on the TV briefly and you'll see that I'm right. Um, everything uh, Biden lays his hand to is just wild disaster. It's not like not going that well. It is disaster. And most Americans and a lot of people who actually voted for him, because there's like, there's a few, they, and obviously not that many, but the fact is they see what you see. They see what happened in Afghanistan, a, a satanic abdication of our duty and our leadership. You think they don't see that? 
You think they don't see what's happening? The People see all of this stuff. They see the lack of transparency and the lack of logic with masks and vaccines. They see it all and it troubles them. So be a voice of strength and clarity in the midst of this, because there are people wondering, where do I go from here? Uh, they don't know that Jesus is the answer yet. But God is doing something. And part of it, I think, uh, to, uh, to use the scripture, I couldn't remember where it was, but Pastor Gary uh, Hamrick, of course, uh, looked it up on Google for me. <laughs> he, uh, it's Isaiah 59, 19. Both of us thought it was like in one of Paul's epistles. It just sounds like it's someone. Then you realize, no, it's actually in Isaiah. It says, when the enemy comes in like a flood, we all know this. When the enemy comes in like a flood, the spirit of the Lord will raise up a standard against him. Now, you understand that's kind of what's happening right now. Everywhere you turn, it's madness. You've never seen anything like it. Praise the Lord, right? But everywhere you turn, madness on every side. Well, the Lord tells us in Scripture, when these things happen, he'll raise up a standard. Now, a standard is a battle flag, a battle standard, okay? So the enemy comes in, and the Lord raises up a battle flag, and we say, there's the flag, and we go into the battle. Now, I believe that what I talk about uh, in my new book, uh, Is Atheism Dead?, is part of this because I cannot claim that I knew what's in the book. Usually people think like, oh, Eric, you're smart, you knew all this stuff and then you put it in a book. I knew nothing until I decided to write the book. And even what I knew was a gift from God. So you think maybe I'm being slightly falsely humble? I'm not. God allows us to see what he allows us to see uh, at certain times. And I can tell you that the reason I wrote this book is because of a few things the Lord clearly just put in front of me. I, I did not naturally come uh, by them. I wasn't like doing research. But before I get into that, let me explain uh, the title of the book, the, the conceit behind the book. Uh, it's called Is Atheism Dead? Because some of you know there was a Time Magazine article in 1966, famous article, Is God Dead? And the implication clearly is, yes, he is. Science has led us away from those primitive religious impulses that we had to cling to uh, in the childhood uh, of, of, of our race. We are now maturing into the adulthood of our race where we understand that reason uh, is where we are. So we put away those childish things like faith in the God of the Bible and all those fairy tales. And we're moving, uh, you know, into a more sophisticated time, right? We all know that. Science is pushing God out. And before you know it, we will be, you know, uh, brave uh, new human beings who, who are alone in the universe and we're fine with that, right? Well, no, it didn't turn out that way. But the secular culture, you know, I live in New York City, I went to Yale, that world is convinced that that high watermark of, you know, God being dead, 1966, like we've never really moved from that. We figured it out, science is disproving faith and all the sophisticated people know it. Except, in fact, that is absolutely not true. And I don't just mean that we know God is real. What I mean is that since about 1966, when the Is God Dead cover, you know, was printed, this article, since then, the evidence has been coming in steadily, 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 steadily from science mainly, but from everywhere, but principally science, that is not less than astonishing proof that the world in which we live could never have come into being randomly as the uh, atheistic materialists say and have kind of convinced everybody, yeah, faith is just some private thing, but in reality, it's all here. We don't need God, right? Well, since 1966, roughly, information has come in, but if you buy into the narrative of God is probably dead, you kind of ignore the evidence as it comes in. You've already moved on, and you're in this other paradigm, this secular paradigm. So my thesis in the book is that while people have been sleeping, acting as though this, this paradigm is the new way forward, over 50 plus years, evidence has come in that piles up and up and up and up, but nobody ever said, hey, hey, wait a minute, Look at all the evidence, because people aren't looking at it. They've just, they've moved on. They just assumed that we, we know. So whatever evidence comes in, it's like the, the larger narrative is already God is dead. There's no God. We know that. 
Well, I'm here to tell you that uh, the evidence has come in slowly in such a way that that's the reason people don't ever declare that God is alive is because the evidence comes in slowly. So it's not kind of like, you know, we discovered the cure for cancer, big headline. It's kind of like it's, it's slow and it's slow. So who's ever going to say, everybody stop, look at the evidence. That's effectively what I try to do in this book because I became convinced through meeting two people actually kind of tipped me over because in my miracles book, I already deal with what's called the fine-tuned universe, evidence from science that there's not the ghost of a chance that we just got here randomly. There's not the ghost of a chance, right? But when I wrote that book, I kind of, I thought there's more and more evidence. I just put two chapters about this stuff, but this evidence keeps coming in from science that it gets stronger and stronger and stronger. So in this book, I thought maybe I should update that and, and talk about what science is saying about whether there's a God. And I'm here to tell you, if you're an atheist, it's like, effectively speaking, game over. Now, you kind of think, oh, it can't be. I I'm here to tell you, yes, it is. Atheism is intellectually untenable. Uh, I don't mean, I don't think atheism works. I mean, you cannot be an intellectually satisfied atheist if you look at the facts. You could be an agnostic. You could say, I I'm not sure. I hate Christians. The Bible's stupid. You could say that if you want. But you can't say there is no God. If you say there is no God, it's at this point like saying the earth is flat. You know, no one ever landed on the moon. That was done in a TV studio in Houston. It never happened. It's nonsense. It's nonsense. But only recently have I come to see this very clearly. Now, there are three parts of the, of the book. The first part is science. The second part is biblical archaeology. And the third part, I just deal with atheism. And in each part, I have had the privilege, and I mean this, of somehow being allowed by the Lord to see stuff that is so astonishing. I said, I have to get this out to people because you're not going to read about this in the New York Times or in any place. This is crazy stuff. So just dealing with science, uh, I mentioned the fine-tuned universe. There are three arguments from science that I use uh, in this book. Some of you know them. Some of you, How many of you know the fine-tuned universe argument? Some, some of you know. Okay. Most of us don't know this. You ask most people, Christians, and they're like, no, I don't know that. Trust me, folks. It's insane. It's insane as an argument. It's like freaky proof of God. But then it's equally insane that we don't know it. How can we live in a world where we say, I believe in God? But the most, I'll give an example, uh, and I write about this in the book. Christopher Hitchens, the most famous atheist of our time, was asked, I don't know, 10 years ago, right before he died, a couple years before he died, he was asked, what's the most compelling argument on the God side of the equation? And in a rare moment of honesty, because he was not the kind of guy to like give points to the other side ever. In a rare moment, he says, oh, the fine-tuned argument. There's no question. That's the one that gives us you know, trouble. We have to work it out. Da -da -da -da. What does he mean? In a nutshell, it's this. The more science learns, the more obvious it is that there isn't a chance of what people said in 1966 or before that we just got here randomly and oh happy day we're luckily living on a planet that can support life science more and more proves that can't be for example you think what does it matter what the size of a planet is okay we now know fairly recently that if this planet were slightly smaller or slightly bigger Life couldn't exist here. Now, that is a scientific fact, what I just told you. It's not a Christian fact. It's a scientific fact. They know it. But how many of you knew it? How many of you hear scientists talk about this? Does, you know, it's not going to make you popular if you're a scientist in that secular world saying this kind of stuff. But science tells us this. Not Christians. Science says this. Science says if planet Jupiter, have you ever seen Jupiter with the naked eye? It's a, this is the church, I know. Can I say naked eye? Can I say that? <laughs> if you ever see Jupiter with a naked eye, it's like a little pinprick in the, in the sky. It is an unbelievably massive planet. But when you think of how far away it is, any logical person would say, what effect could that have on whether there's life on Earth? It's pretty obvious. It's ridiculous, right? Science tells us that if that massive, massive, massive planet were not where it is, sucking with its gravity asteroids 
and meteors and comets in its general direction away from Earth, if it weren't there, if it just happened not to be there, a thousand times as many asteroids you know, would hit Earth. And there's not a chance that there would be life on Earth if that were the case, as I'll tell you in a minute, because when an asteroid or a comet comes in, it does tremendous damage. Some of you know that uh, 66 million years ago, dinosaurs were wiped out because of one that came into our atmosphere. Like, the damage they can do is insane. Well, it just so happens, you know, by coincidence, that there's a planet so huge that it sucks away most of those. Who, who has ever heard this? Why don't we know this? Why isn't this taught in schools? This is science, folks. This is not Christian theology. This is science. Now, those are two obvious, easy things. But it goes on and on and on and on that there are things in, on Earth, in the way the Earth exists, in details and details and details, that the more science we know, the more obvious it is that if things were just a hair different, no life would exist. That's what science says. So the narrative has shifted. Science is not leading us away from God, it's leading us toward God, so that if you're honest intellectually, there's just no chance that you're gonna say, I think everything just showed up here. You're gonna at least be spooked by the evidence. You're gonna be freaked out because it looks, it doesn't look good if you don't think there's a designer or a creator. It looks so designed. Every day that passes, science discovers another thing, another thing, another thing. I have an entire chapter on water and another chapter on sunlight. Never in my life have I heard any of the stuff that I put in these chapters. When I discovered it, I said, science is now telling us stuff about water that if you read it carefully and slowly, it will freak you out. You never dreamt that water was anything amazing. It is insanely amazing, just the fact that that liquid called water, when it freezes, when it turns to a solid, most liquids, when they turn to a solid, get heavier and sink, obviously, right? Not water. Have you ever seen uh, frozen water? I call it ice. Have you heard of that? <laughs> Have you noticed that it floats? It has an insanely rare capacity as a liquid that when it turns to a solid, it gets lighter than the liquid. As a result of that, we're able to have life on planet Earth because of what frozen water does. It protects the life beneath it in ponds and lakes. And Instead of freezing from the bottom up, there'd be like a, a runaway freezing effect. I don't have time to give you the details, but the more you look into it, the more you get freaked out, whether you're a believer or not. It is just, you start thinking, this is weird. This is weird. I mean, I can understand, I believe in God, but this is freaking me out. I had no idea that every tiny thing, the mass of the universe, everything is perfectly, perfectly calibrated, so perfectly that it makes me nervous because there's no way this could have just happened. Any intellectually honest scientist knows this is true. So the ones that really hate it have come up with insane theories like the multiverse theory. Have you heard of that? It's just loony stuff. There's no evidence, but they said anything but God. So we'll just say there's an infinity of universes. You have evidence? No, but shut up. We've got an infinity of universes, and we just happen to be in the one that just happens to be, you know, perfect for us. <laughs> Science is leading us to God, but the secular media doesn't report on it. The main reason I decided to write about it was I met a guy in Houston named James Tour, probably the top nanoscientist on planet Earth. He creates molecules in the lab. He is aware of how infinitely difficult it is to manipulate things on that level and how that can never happen randomly, getting order on that level. You have to have intense focus and you have to know what you're doing. So he came to me and he said, that in 1952, some of you remember this from your textbooks, from high school or something, if somebody says, hey, how did life come into being? We're not talking about how did life, once we have life, how did it become fish and people and apes and giraffes? And we're not talking about like evolution, that whole argument. No, forget all that. That's separate. Put that to bed. Let's just talk about how life came into being in the first place on planet Earth. Ask a scientist, how did it happen? Go, tell me. Nobody knows. 
The reason nobody asked the question is obviously because there's no answer and it's very, 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 very embarrassing. We don't want to talk about that. We're just going to pretend we know. Uh, James Tour says there was an experiment in 1952, and I remembered. I was like, oh yeah, that was on the test in high school or something, right? In 1952, they did an experiment at the University of Chicago. Some students said, okay, we know that the early Earth had this kind of a, uh, you know, the, the saline solution, the waters on covering the Earth about four billion years ago had this stuff in it. Probably lightning struck, and you know that led to the first life. Whatever. But they did some experiments just so, and they got amino acids to emerge out of this. And they said, hey, there you go, amino acids. Now, the more you know about science, the more you know, so what? Like, you're going to impress me with amino acids. Uh, that's, not even, <laughs> that's not even close to life, right? That's not even close. It's like saying, well, uh, we got metals. It's like, so pff, you can have a computer in the next 10 minutes, no problem, right? <laughs> You got real metal? Whoa, that's just, you're on your way. It's only a matter of time before we, we make the next steps and you're gonna figure out our computers. So we, we figured it out. We figured out nothing. In 1952, they figured that out and they said, well, that's the first step. In the decades ahead, we're gonna, you know, we're gonna, we're gonna cross every I, uh, cross every T, dot every I. We're gonna, we're gonna figure it out. Well, James Tour is here to say, well, he doesn't say it because he's so humble, but he's basically the, the expert in the world on this stuff. He's a profound Christian, and I d devoted two chapters in the book to him. He says, the more time has passed since 1952, not the more we figured out. The more time has passed since 1952, the more we see clearly that we know nothing. In 1952, we were dumb enough and ignorant enough to think that we figured it out. But every year that passes, we learn more and more and more and we begin to find out that, uh, no, we don't have any idea. We were dumb enough then to think we did. We now are smart enough to know we know nothing. But who wants to say that? Who wants to be the one to say, we've just, uh, we've just figured it out. Science leads us to know that we have absolutely zero clue how life came into being. That would be embarrassing. So you don't hear any headlines about that, do you? Well, that's why I wrote about it in the book. I said it's time for believers to know that science has led us to the point where we can say emphatically there is no way that we know of for life to come into being randomly. This thing that we've been teaching in schools for 70 years is garbage. We need to stop it. Let's be honest at least. Let's be honest and say we have no idea. Now the reason we don't want to be honest is because if we have no idea, what does that tell you? Probably God might have done it. What do you think? I mean, if you find a computer, you don't go like, eh, it probably happened randomly, but because I don't believe in God or I don't believe in any creator of computers, so I, I just think it happened randomly. Any person with a brain knows there's no chance this computer just, you know, evolved because there was like a tornado and it threw some stuff together. We all know that can happen, right? So that part of the book is to me big news. And I said, I need to get this out to the church because church, we need to know what science says and what it doesn't say. We need to know that it's pointing to God. We need to know that. And I'm not embarrassed since the, the, the culture has canceled me and knocked me off YouTube. And so I'm not embarrassed anymore to say, I need you to pre-order the book because I can't, I don't have access, you know, to, to a lot of the places that I would have in the past. But I'm here to tell you that that, that book will bolster your faith. I mean, the information is sick. I, I, I don't think I'll ever get over it in my life when I realize that I lived at a time when the Lord allowed us to see these things that we couldn't see 50 years ago. And it goes, it's so crazy. Uh, so James Tour made me think, somebody has to write about this. He's one of these sm scientists who's so smart, he, like, he doesn't write popular books. And I'm like, Jim, please, we need you to write. He's like, no, I'm doing, you know, he's writing like peer-reviewed articles and stuff that we can't read. Um, so I said, well, I'm at least going to put it in my book because the world needs to know what you know. And so I wrote about that. And then I write about all this other stuff, fine-tuned universe stuff. But the headline is science since 1966, since the God is Dead article is pointing us dr dramatically, I cannot underscore this enough, dramatically to belief in God. That's science, science. We need to know that and we need to tell people who don't know that, agnostics, friends who aren't sure what they think, 
Like, look, just look at the facts and you tell me what you think. Well, archaeology is a similar thing. I met another guy. I was speaking at Skip Heitzig's church in Albuquerque, and Skip uh, says to me, yeah, have you met, uh, you know, you're preaching tomorrow, but today you've you know, got some time. You should talk to uh, Stephen Collins. He's a biblical archaeologist. He discovered biblical Sodom. I, I said, what, what? Biblical Sodom, like 1700 B.C., Abraham and Lot, like he discovered that? That's like in the distant mythic times of the scripture. That's like right after Noah. Like, what are you talking about? He, what do you mean discovered biblical Sodom? It was destroyed. Nobody can discover it, right? He says, well, you should talk to him. I talked to him. He wrote a book on the subject. Has anybody read that book? Okay, that proves my point. He discovered it a number of years ago. It was like 2012 or something like that. He wrote a book on it. It's a good book. But nobody knows about it. I said, when I started to look into this, I said, this is not a theory. Like, this is so detailed, there's no question he discovered biblical Sodom. Why isn't it in the headlines? Now, actually, literally tomorrow in Newsweek magazine, newsweek.com, I guess at this point, I wrote an article about this. And on my radio program, TV program, I had him on to talk about this a couple of days ago. So if you go, uh, if you just go to my website, ericpatax.com, sign up for my newsletter, all this stuff will be sent to you. But I mean, we need to know this is not theory. He looks through the scriptures. He says, if Sodom exists, it has to be here, north of the Dead Sea. Nobody's looking there. Why is nobody looking there? Why is nobody looking on this side of the Jordan? Oh, because for 30 years, we've had like military weirdness between Israel and Jordan or whatever. Suddenly, we can look there. So in 1996, and the years after he starts looking, he finds a place. He says, I think this is it. He digs. At 1700 BC, he discovers a lair he calls the destruction matrix five feet of soot right at the time that we say Sodom was destroyed. Five feet of soot. Now, all the scientists say there's no way that could have happened with an earthquake, no way with a volcano, no way, there's no way this could have happened except for one. The scientists say. They say this in the article that I write about tomorrow in Newsweek, and obviously in the book. But they say there's only one thing that could have happened. They call it a cosmic airburst event. <laughs> uh, that means a meteorite or asteroid came, this is what the science says, this is the only one way this happened, came into the atmosphere, just like it did in Siberia in 1908. There was one that hit, so we know about this. The Tunguska event in Siberia, a meteorite 180 feet in diameter, way smaller than this space, right? Tiny, when you think of the size of Earth, tiny. Came in 1908, you know, kind of like managed to, to get past Jupiter somehow. <laughs> once every several thousand years or something like that, managed to get past Jupiter, comes into the Earth, 35,000 miles per hour, explodes over a remote section of Siberia, and in a second, explodes with the force of, this is what science says, 1,000 Hiroshima bombs. 1,000, boom, instantly flattens 80 million trees. Imagine what one Hiroshima bomb does. Then imagine what a thousand do. The heat is infinitely hotter than the surface of the sun. It's insane stuff. In this destruction matrix in uh, what's now Jordan, at 1700 BC, they find this soot. He pulls out a piece of pottery. Now, he's a ceramic typologist. He knows instantly what kind of a jar this is from 1700 BC. He knows it's from 1700 BC. But he flips it over, and there's a glassy surface on it. And he says, we didn't have technology for that until 750 AD, 24 centuries later. What's it doing here at 1700 BC? Well, he takes it to the lab, and at the lab they say there's only one thing that could have done this. Cosmic airburst event. Intense heat for a very brief period of time melted the pottery. 4,000 degrees for about 25 seconds. 
melted the pottery. Anyway, I could go on and on. It's obviously in the book. The details are freaky, but there's no question that this happened. Now, at the 1700 BC level, he goes to the next level up. There's no civilization in that spot for seven centuries. Seven centuries, there's no civilization on that spot. It's one of the premier spots in the world. People had s settled there for thousands of years before 1700 BC. And for 700 years after this event of destruction that sheared off walls, 12 foot thick brick walls, instantly vaporized, blasted. It, it did such destruction that no one dared to settle there for seven centuries. Every detail that you look into, you say, this is wild. How did I not know this? Is the Bible proving to be historically accurate? Now that's just the main piece, but I write all kinds of stuff that they have dis dis discovered. I talk about the discovery, I will just say this because this is insane. If you read this in the book, you, you, you won't believe it until you read it. They discovered the first century home in Nazareth of Jesus, Mary, and Joseph. That doesn't seem possible, right? Didn't seem possible to me. You look into the de details. When the enemy comes in like a flood, the Lord will raise up a standard. Things are coming out now from science, from biblical archaeology, that are so astonishing that they're making it more and more difficult not to believe if you dare to look at the facts. The third part of the book, I deal with atheism as a philosophy. And I say that anybody who takes atheism lightly is a fool. So Christopher Hitchens and Dawkins and those guys, I deal with them kind of severely because I was actually embarrassed by their intellectual dishonesty, really. Um, I was thinking that they're going to come up with something impressive. It's, it's embarrassing. And I show that in the book. People who took atheism seriously, I can respect you because you understand it's bleak. It's not a fun thing to understand we're alone in the universe. How do you have any morality, any ethics? How do you believe in anything, in any meaning? If you're alone in the universe, if you know there's no God, they tried to work it out. Jean-Paul Sartre and Albert Camus, two of the biggest names, they, they were troubled by this. They were trying to work it out. How do we live in a world where everything is random? There's no meaning, there's no God. How do we do that? They were at least smart enough to be troubled by it. And anybody who looks at it seriously says, this doesn't make sense. It can't be, but I think it is, but I don't like it. That's healthy atheism, if you believe that. But this is another wild headline, and I'll close on this. Nobody knows this. I'm, I'm sure almost nobody in, this, nobody in this room, I guarantee, knows both of these things that I'm going to say. And that's why I feel like I want to get this information out to believers and non-believers, because this is insane that I stumbled upon this. And again, all the details are there. It's not like I'm making it up. You can look into it and look at the books that I got it from. Here's the punchline. The two most famous atheists of the 20th century, actually all three, Anthony Flew as well, but these two guys, Camus and Sartre, both of them, at the end of their lives, separately, 1960, 1980, when they died, just before they died, both of them came to Christian faith. Nobody knows this. Now, can you imagine being me and thinking, like, I'm alone in a room reading something. Am I going insane? You know, it's like watching a rooster lay an egg. What do you do? What do you do? Like, what? Somebody else has to come in and look at this. Am I crazy? Am I hallucinating? The book about Camus didn't come out until like 2001, 41 years after he was killed in a car crash. So nobody knew about this. And the book came out. Nobody cared. I read about the book in another book. And I looked into it. I said, this is everybody needs to know. One of the premier atheists in the world said, I want to be baptized. This is the meaning of life. Camus, same thing. I'm out of time, so I'll stop with the details. But do you understand, why is it that only now does this stuff come out? I just have to believe the Lord is doing this to encourage us in our faith and to say the darker things get, the brighter I'm going to get, not just for your sake, because I want to encourage my church, but I want you to be an encouragement to those people who are looking around for meaning, who are saying the world has gone mad. Is it just me? What is happening? 
Here's what's happening, folks. The Lord is allowing this season in our lives to wake us up, to get us fighting, no longer to be passive, but to say the Lord has called us. He doesn't raise up a battle flag. He doesn't raise up a standard against the enemy so that we can, like, have a quiet time and pray about it. A battle flag means we go to war. So you go to war on your knees. You... you When you, when you go to war for the Lord, we, you understand what I'm talking about, okay? You go to war in your prayer closet. You join school boards. You say, no, I won't take that uh, medicine. Yes, I'm on ivermectin. Deal with it. Uh, because there are people that you don't know, you haven't met them yet. They're looking to you to say, does that person really believe that stuff? Do they really, even with all this craziness and all this social pressure, are they going to stand firm? The Lord wants you to stand firm. I believe he's given you this information, given me this information for such a time as this. Trust me, I didn't think I would write this book, but by God's grace, I, I, I've done it. The details will astonish you, I promise you. I still can't get over the Lord allows us to live in an exciting time when this stuff is coming out. Be encouraged. God bless you.